<laughs> My name is Terry Silva, and I am one of the board members for the Eden Allen Homestead Museum. I'm not here too much because I work full time, but I like to come on the weekend. And I know a little bit about Thea, and I've been asked to introduce her. So here we go. Thank you for coming out on this frigid Vermont winter day. <laughs> Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge our sponsors who help make our homestead programs possible. Vermont AARP, North Country Community Credit Union, and M&T Bank. Also, Town Meeting Television, which records our lectures and makes them available online to those unable to attend. A few words about our speaker, no doubt known to many of you. Thea Lewis is a Burlington native who grew up in the city's old North End. Her six books from the History Press are often interspersed with people that, who are familiar to her, and they are available at Phoenix Books, in case anybody would like to get one. She's also the founder of the Queen City Ghost Walk, the tour company she's operated since 2002. And some of you may know her by her spookier alter ego, Vermont's Queen of Halloween. <laughs> I personally went on a couple of the ghost walks when she first started, and they're very cool if you ever want to do it, or if you can. You run around behind buildings in Burlington, she goes, this happened here, and this happened, and you're like, wow. <laughs> Things I didn't know. Her latest book, True Crime Stories of Burlington, Vermont, was published last September. You can follow her on Facebook as Thea Lewis or Queen City Ghost Walk, Instagram as Vermont Ghost Guide, or Twitter as Just Thea Lewis. And without further eloquence, and I've been waiting to say that line from a quiet man, <laughs> yes. here is Thea Lewis. Hello. It is so much fun to be here with you today. I have to ask, I was here, oh my gosh, it must have been eight, 10 years ago. Who, was there anybody here uh, here now that who was here then? Oh my goodness, well thank you for coming back. And I, is there any, another show of hands, anybody been already on a Queen City Ghost Walk? Yes, okay, quite a few of you. Well, our tour season is going to be starting up again in August and I'm making plans for it right now. And as some of you may know, if you follow me on any of those social media uh, platforms, we had a couple of guides last year, new guides for the first time in 20 years. And I felt pretty lucky because one of them happened to be the sexton for the Burlington Cemeteries. She's the administrative person uh, and, uh, and her name is Holly. And then the other one is a young woman who writes writes um, sort of spooky music for uh, streaming TV shows and movies. So I thought, <laughs> not too bad for the first time hiring people for the ghost tour. So here we are. Um, I'm going to see if I can get back to where I'm supposed to be here. Uh, apparently not. Escape? No? Ah, there we are. Um, so today's program, it's a teeny tiny little thing here. Um, Today's program, The Stories That Shaped Us, was inspired simply um, and, and exclusively for this event because I started thinking when I first spoke with John, uh, who got in touch with me, oh my goodness, with six books, and this is the first time I've been here in, uh, in so many years, what in the world am I going to concentrate on? And I thought, what is the common thread here? And the common thread is all of the stories that I write, all of the ghost stories, and all of the crime stories, and all of the stories like um, of the notable folks like um, Admiral Henry Mayo, who are buried in Lakeview Cemetery. I don't know how many of you knew that, um, the, the Admiral of the US Navy. Uh, all of those stories are stories about people who helped shape either our city or our world. So I thought, OK, the stories that shaped us. And away we go. Um, I wanted to start off. Uh, by giving a nod to the first people who walked on the lands here uh, in the city of Burlington in Chittenden County. And these are the Abnaki and other visiting tribes to the Champlain Valley, uh, to Lake Champlain. And if you've lived in Burlington for any period of time, you know where Rock Dunder is. Rock Dunder, I'm always telling the tours of little kids that I bring along the waterfront, I say, see that outcropping of rock sticking up out there that looks kind of like a shark's fin? And they say, yes. And I say, well, that's Rock Dunder. Um, years ago, when the native tribes were meeting there at that rock to uh, talk over their treaties and exchange gifts, it went by another name. It was called Odzihozu, or he who created everything. 
And this was kind of a, uh, a god or a totem to the Abnaki people. And Ozihozu was supposed to have been this large, larger than life character. And he actually um, had no legs, but powerful forearms. And the legend went that he would drag himself around all of the land we see today. And he created the furrows that were the valleys. And that created the mountains next to the valleys. And finally, uh, when everything was done, he dragged himself around enough, I guess, um, it began to rain. And it rained and rained and rained. And this huge ravine that he had created became Lake Champlain. And apparently with the sun sparkling on the water after the rains, it was such a beautiful sight, he decided to plant himself right there in the middle of everything so he could see it for all eternity. Hozu hozu. I just love it. Uh, let's see if I do the right thing here. Perhaps not. Uh, perhaps I'll go this way. Um, nope. <laughs> It's kind of bumping me out here, so I'm not sure what's going on. Oh. Well, let me try it this way. I guess I need some help, because it's not... I've got another screen up here for some reason. Wait a minute. Can I do that? No. Uh, just click out? Just click out. Okay. Ta-da. All right. There we go. And now, Ethan Allen. <laughs> the reason we're sitting where we're sitting today, Ethan Allen. And are there any uh, Ethan Allen fans here, people who read a lot about Ethan Allen? There you go. So uh, Ethan Allen, pretty much inescapable when you're talking about Vermont history. Um, I was so excited to go to Washington, D.C. and go into the beautiful statuary rooms at the Capitol and see all of these statues that had been chosen by each state, two for each state, of all these notables. And of course, Ethan Allen was there. Ethan Allen is um, uh, an amazing character to me and also uh, a kind of a comic relief because when I think of Ethan Allen, I think of all of the little stories that I've been told about him and have read about him that make him the colorful character that he was um, from the things that he drank, stone walls. Anyone ever tried a stone wall, which apparently was hard cider and rum and, and beer back in the old days. <laughs> this was something that people sat around the fire and knocked back and probably knocked him out. Um, I love hearing about the things he drank, about him tarring and feathering people. And I love the fact that he, um, is in one of my books, I tell the ghost story of Ethan Allen. He apparently, when uh, he was a man sitting by the fire, talking with his cohorts, he would claim that he was going to be reincarnated. And when he came back, he was going to be brought back as a magnificent white steed. <laughs> and knowing all of his exploits, and that he probably had a head that would have a hard time fitting into this room because of his ego, I thought, isn't that typical? And just kind of filed it away. And wouldn't you know it, maybe two or three years later, I started hearing stories from people about the Intervale lands and how people crossing through them early in the morning, in the mists of morning, would sometimes see the shadowy figure of this magnificent white horse galloping across the fields. And I said, dang, Ethan Allen. <laughs> Oh, the joke is on me. The joke is on me. Uh, and then we've got to go to his brother Ira, little brother Ira, who um, I have a soft spot for. Um, Ira Allen, as that younger brother, had to be running as fast as he could to keep up with this larger-than-life personality that was his brother Ethan Allen. And there's a story about Ira Allen. Talk about the stories that shaped us and the stories that shaped my tour, Queen City Ghost Walk. There's a great story about Ira Allen visiting his neighbors, people who lived next to his property, these Scottish folks. And often, Ira Allen and these folks would gather in front of the fire, and the people would tell him about Scotland and about how the ghosts in Scotland were absolutely the most fearsome creatures anywhere. And they said, you know, you actually have a ghost down at the end of your pasture land. You ought to be careful about that. And he laughed, filed it away. And then one night, he stayed a little too long drinking by their fire. And he realized that he had to get home and tend to the things that needed to be tended to. When he got home, he saw that some of his young goats had gotten out in the cold spring weather and were gamboling around. And he was going to have to walk in the dark and what was now a spitting snow to gather them up. So there he went, and one little goat, darn it, kept eluding him. So he kept having to walk 
farther and farther to the edge of the pasture, <laughs> far away from his house, farther into the dark, with this little goat galloping along ahead of him. Well, finally, he got nearly to the end of his land, and there he saw her, this fearsome hag, standing there on his property, waving her arm at him. She's a terrible sight. And he thought, oh my goodness, those folks were absolutely right. They were telling the truth. I can't believe this. And he was about to turn and run, but there was the little goat. He still needed to get it. And he thought, what kind of man would I be if I did not go and meet that fearsome, horrible hag face to face? So he crept up, and as he got closer and closer, he realized that it was not a ghost or a fearsome hag at all. It was just a tree with a broken branch waving in the wind, <laughs> waving and waving. And so I love that because it's a lesson to me and should be to all of you that every ghost story you can debunk makes the ones that you can't debunk even spookier. <laughs> and who do we have next? Oh. Well, going sort of chronologically through time, uh, we leave the 1700s and the early 1800s, and we and we and we head to uh, or go into the late 1700s, early 1800s, and we look at the Pomeroy home, um, which, if you live in the Burlington area, it used to be a different color. It was a light sort of creamy, yellowish white for years and years. I used to walk by that place and think, oh, if only that were my home having absolutely no idea that this was a place where Dr. John Pomeroy used to have young medical students uh, come and visit with him and used to dissect corpses right there in the house. So that might have, the thought of it might have put me off as an 18 or 19 year old young person. Um, Dr. John Pomeroy was not in fact a, um, a certified medical doctor. But back in those days, late 1700s, early 1800s, if you had some idea of what made the human body tick and people had faith in you, respect in your abilities, you were a doctor. Dr. John Pomeroy ended up being honored by having the very first medical school at the University of Vermont named after him. Oh, what a wonderful thing. This man who was uh, so well respected in town and Dr. John Pomeroy, uh, his family, is buried Right as you walk in the front gate at Elmwood Cemetery, if you have not been there, um, I, I encourage you to go. But there's a great, oh, holy cow, pardon me, Butterfingers. <laughs> Gotta go back. You're getting, close your eyes, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, it doesn't, it just means you get to see them again. Um, so here we go. There's a wonderful connection between, a loose but wonderful connection, between Dr. John Pomeroy and Pomeroy Hall and this gentleman here, H.H. H. Holmes, because H.H. H. Holmes attended the medical school at Pomeroy Hall back in the day. Now, if you don't know who H.H. H. Holmes is, what a terrible, devious character. Um, he, um, he was a man who started off his life in Gilmantown, New Hampshire, as a young man, um, married a young woman there, her parents were well-to-do, her father financed his education, and he wanted to become a doctor, so he came to Burlington, began to attend the medical school at UVM. But he left after just a year, saying that the medical school was much too small to suit his needs. Well, I don't think that was it at all. I think that H.H. H. Holmes was already up to some of the shenanigans he became famous for. Uh, Burlington was such a tightly knit community back then. H.H. Uh, H. Holmes left, and he ended up in the city of Chicago where he became the fellow we know uh, from Eric Larson's book as the devil in the white city. Uh, this was a man who was uh, expert at murder. And he ended up building a place in Chicago that was called later on by people after he was found out, the murder castle. Uh, he was just such a devious man that in the building of this castle, he would hire different construction crews. He would hire one crew and he would have them say, create these dumb waiters that bodies could be thrown in to be brought down to the basement to be gotten rid of uh, because he was having these rooms that other folks had built that were airtight where these people would asphyxiate and then there they'd go down to the basement. Now, say you were, um, oh, somebody who was of average stature, your skeleton was not much to write home about. H.H. H. Holmes in his murder castle would probably throw you in the cremation device he had. But what if you were, say, a woman, maybe six feet tall or more, very rare in those days. H.H. H. Holmes would dismember you and throw you in this vat of acid he had, 
take all the meat from your bones, string you back together, and sell you to a medical school or a prominent doctor in the area. Horrible, horrible, creepy man. Now you're saying to yourself maybe, what in the world? I mean, what, what do you think he could have been doing, Thea, here in the city of Burlington? Well, H.H. H. Holmes lived here in the city when our lumber business was booming. If you were to walk around the waterfront back in H.H. H. Holmes' time, you would see lumber stacked 40 feet high as far as the eye could see. And imagine people coming in by ship or by train, heading to the city of Burlington, trying to get their bearings, and they might come upon this dapper young gentleman who was all too willing to help them. Why? Because he could bump them off and then he could provide a cadaver for a doctor or medical student here in the area and collect a fee of $30, which was about what you would pay for a decent cow back in those days. So horrible, terrible criminal um, was actually, I'll leave the rest for, um, you can find H.H. H. Holmes in True Crime Stories of Burlington, Vermont and also in Haunted Burlington, probably also in Wicked Vermont, those books. Um, but he was eventually captured, um, thanks in part to something that happened later on when he returned to the city of Burlington. Devious, horrible, horrible man. And then uh, we go on uh, to, uh, not exactly chronological, here we go, but Timothy Follett, who um, Certainly, you could say he made his mark on the city of Burlington. When we go into Elmwood Cemetery and see Timothy Follett's stone, and unfortunately, it cracked. It's on its face, and I've, uh, I've talked to um, a, a gentleman who was a local firefighter here, now retired, who restores these things. And we're supposed to get together this year when it gets warmer and see if we can fix Timothy Follett's headstone so it's in a little better position. But his real monument is uh, is this house, the Follett House, which you might know as the Pomerleau Real Estate Agency. Um, it's a beautiful place inside and out, and it's got so much ghostly activity. Uh, nobody in there is shy talking about it. Uh, it's one of the main stops on a Queen City Ghost Walk tour. I'll tell you that uh, one day I was doing some grocery shopping in South Burlington, and a young woman, pretty young woman, came running up to my car and she said, you. And I said, yes. And she said, you're the lady who does the ghost tours. And I said, guilty as charged. <laughs> and I was standing next to um, a car that I had at the time that had a huge logo on it. So I was, it was no way she was going to <laughs> mistake me for somebody else. And she said, do you ever go to the Follett House? And I said, yeah, only several times a week. When you, we hit September, I'm there a lot. And she said, well, has anyone ever told you that if you work there, strange things might happen to you? And I said, yes, darling, but what's happened to you? <laughs> well, she told me that she'd only been working there a little while, and she'd heard the stories, oh, you know, weird things are going to happen to you, don't worry about it, everything will be okay. So she'd been there for a while, a month or so, and she came in one morning and found that there was nothing on her desk. All of her pictures of her children and her husband and her dog, all of her little desk toys, all of her pens and pencils, her favorites, gone. So she stood up and said to her coworker, excuse me, you know those people who clean when we leave at night? And the woman said, yes. She said, do you think that they cleaned my desk and then just forgot to put my stuff back? She said the coworker looked at her and said, oh, sweetheart, they don't clean our desks. And we're going to find your stuff. But when we do, it's going to be in the damnedest place. <laughs> and it was in the damnedest place, apparently. Upstairs, underneath a low bench in the cupola, all stacked together like Jenga. <laughs> so somebody being crazy in that place. Timothy Follett, uh, another person I have a real soft spot for, he um, was a young boy of just about seven when his father passed away and his mother moved him and his sisters to the city of Burlington. She wanted better opportunities for her children and for Timothy Follett, a bright young man, it seemed like the sky was the limit. I mean, here's this young man who graduates from the University of Vermont, uh, very young, in his teens, becomes a lawyer, um, passes the bar, I think he's, uh, he's 21, 22, and then he begins to build businesses and design canal boats and, uh, you know, actually um, with a group of investors had a textile mill in the city of Winooski and that's why in Winooski we have a street called Follett Street. Now, um, at one point in time, and I don't know how many people are longtime Burlingtonians might remember urban renewal. Uh, back in those days, I mean, look at that house, the city wanted to tear it down. 
The VFW owned it at the time. It was a mess, not inspectable. And so the Pomerleaus came in and said, we'll get the historic preservation money and we'll take some of our money and we will turn this place into the show place it should be. I mean, a jewel in Burlington's crown. And um, I just can't imagine the city of Burlington without this building overlooking the waterfront. Now I have to, some of you may have heard this story if you've been on a walk. One more thing about Timothy Follett and how much I admire him. Um, there was a period of time when I was still learning so much for my tours that I would go home uh, at night um, after being at special collections at UVM and my husband would come home from work and uh, I'd say, oh, you're not gonna believe this thing I found out today about Timothy Follett. And one night we were sitting there after dinner, he had a glass of wine in his hand and I said, oh wait, I forgot to tell you about this thing about Timothy Follett. And he said, Thea, and he put down his wine and he said, you know, if I didn't know better, I'd say you have a little crush on Timothy Follett. <laughs> and I just said, Roger, if the only man other than you I've got a crush on died in the mid 1800s, I think we're doing okay. <laughs> doing just fine. We got here. I wanted to show you Timothy Follett. Um, one of the things he was, was the first president of the Rutland and Burlington Railroad Company. And this is an 1850s era locomotive. My goodness, look at that thing. I don't know whether I'd want to travel on it, but back in the day, people probably felt like, sure, it's fast, what the heck? Um, and then, uh, another of my favorites, um, take a look at this handsome gentleman. Um, if, if any of you follow me on Facebook, can I see a show of hands, Facebook folks? Well, a few, not too many. The, the first time I posted a picture of the young Brigadier General William Wells, um, many of you probably know his statue in Battery Park as, a, as, a, as an older gentleman. Um, I put this picture up on Facebook and one woman commented, oh my goodness, what a Civil War hottie. <laughs> I would tend to agree. Um, and the great thing about William Wells was, it seems like from everything I've read, he was as good as he was handsome. He mustered into the Civil War when it started and he wasn't finished until it was finished. He came back to Vermont and he married a Burlington girl and he went into business with her father and they had the Wells Richardson Company. They had this pharmaceutical firm. Uh, they made all of these uh, dyes and tinctures. They made something that you might, uh, if you've done enough research, want to call snake oil. Um, it was called Payne's Celery Tonic. You know, all of these, all of these crazy tonics that people would uh, sell door to door and sell from wagons in those days. Payne's Celery Tonic, the advertising would make you think that it would cure anything. Headaches, um, oh gosh, uh, gout, gastrointestinal problems, um, insomnia. The thing about Payne's Celery Tonic was though, um, it wasn't that it made you better, but you felt so much better because it was about 20% alcohol. So it's just so, um, Brigadier General William Wells is, um, is buried at Lakeview Cemetery. He is in the book, Lakeview Cemetery of Burlington, Vermont. And uh, what, a, what an incredible character. He was a surveyor uh, as a young man in Waterbury. Uh, I would call him a Renaissance man. He was interested in so many different things and is definitely worth your looking into. And I, I kind of did all that <laughs> talking about, I kind of freeformed that one, but, and there we go. Um, if you didn't know, William Wells has a statue at our Battery Park and there's an identical statue on the battlefield at Gettysburg. And as a Vermonter, it was such a, uh, it's such a moment of pride for me to go to, uh, to go to Gettysburg and to find his statue and to uh, say, my gosh, this is a, this is a Vermonter that people, that people see, uh, you know, all the time and they know, yes, Vermont is not just about maple syrup. <laughs> there we go. Um, I was talking to you about Burlington's waterfront and all the lumber. You can see lumber in the foreground. Uh, and this was actually, there's a big blank space there because um, this is probably after the time that some of the machine shops on the waterfront had burned down and needed to be recreated. If you look in the background, you'll see all of this lumber, all of this industry. Um, imagine standing on you know, Bank Street or College Street back in the day, and that's what you would see. Um, it was a place where uh, not just adults worked, our lumber yards, but little children eight, nine years old worked in these, uh, worked between these stacks of lumber too. And there were very often terrible accidents that occurred there uh, for the folks working on that waterfront. 
there was a gentleman who lived in this great big house that is now part of the UVM campus who had a lot to do with that lumber on the waterfront. Um, I just love this building. It's been restored lately and is so pretty. I'm going to show you this gentleman, Lawrence Barnes. Uh, he had a school named after him. He was a hero in the city of Burlington. He was the man who, when the city kind of threw up its hands after the fire on the waterfront, and I said, gosh, we've got to have these machine shops. We've people, the people are not going to know what to do. Uh, the city is in trouble. And he said he would rebuild them, and he would rebuild them even faster than the city needed them to be rebuilt. Lawrence Barnes was a guy who figured out how to economically strip and ship lumber so that our lumber industry was just just booming back in uh, back in the 1800s so much so that in that third part of the 1800s there were people who claimed to one another on the street that they were afraid that if they were going to build a house they they'd have to get their lumber from another state because right now we're about 70% forested back then we'd cut down so many of our trees we were only about 30% forested so it was quite a quite a boom I want to make sure I'm, there we go, we're doing well, okay. Ah, so I talked to you about William Wells, and this is a gentleman who has a connection to William Wells. He is Dr. Horatio Nelson Jackson, and he's the man who took the very first cross-country drive uh, in a Winton automobile all the way across the United States from San Francisco to New York City, and he did it on a bet. He was just there at a dinner party, enjoying himself, having a great time, probably after a couple of drinks, and, and they're talking about the automobile and how wonderful it is, and uh, you know, well, you couldn't take it very far. And he's like, oh no, I, I believe I could. I think I actually might be able to do that. And uh, so, whoop, no, nope. there we go. So it was in 1903, and he was traveling with uh, this man named Sewell K. Crocker, a young man in his early 20s, and these two guys, had absolutely no idea what was in for them. I mean, they tried to, you know, best laid plans. They, they uh, made sure that they had the appropriate clothing. They made sure that they had the extras that they needed. Um, but it was a long way from point A to point B to point C. And it wasn't like you were going to find an automobile repair shop or a Winton dealership as you made your trek across the country. So they had some pretty interesting adventures. Um, the connection to William Wells is uh, Dr. Horatio Nelson Jackson was married to his daughter Bertha. And uh, later on in his life, I want to tell you, uh, Dr. Dr. Jackson actually was a, a publisher here in the city of Burlington, with the Burlington Daily News. Now, um, this, is, this is the cutest thing. Somewhere near Idaho, they took on a traveling companion, a dog named Bud, and so, <laughs> so that Bud would not, you know, you, here are these guys traveling across all of these different terrains. They had goggles so that they wouldn't you know, get blinded by the debris that was flying at them in their, in their cars. And they made sure Bud had a pair of goggles too. So uh, I just love this little dog. Um, so uh, William Wells and Dr. Jackson uh, and, and their families all buried at Lakeview Cemetery. Um, we're not sure exactly where Bud is. We believe he's buried somewhere on the grounds of the family home. Uh, of Wells family uh, home or Jackson's family home, but we don't we don't know for sure. Okay, you ever look at a picture of somebody, and just by looking at their face, you get you just have this flash of exactly what they might have looked like when they were seven. <laughs> Without the mustache, though. But really, I mean, can't you? You look at you look at John J. Flynn, and it's like. I think that he was that same kind of earnest little boy back in the day. John J. Flynn, what an incredible businessman, um, what an inspiration to the city of Burlington. Although he had no children of his own, um, he was a man who made sure that every New Year's Day, all of the little children in the city of Burlington, boys and girls who happened to be, um, oh gosh, messengers or newspaper deliverers or the kids who stood out on the corner saying, extra, extra, read all about it. He made sure that they were all invited to these big posh parties um, at one or two of the fanciest hotels in the city of Burlington. And there, they would be treated royally. They would be given a turkey dinner. Um, you know, we think of turkey dinner for Thanksgiving. These kids, probably a lot of them didn't see a turkey dinner, you know, all, all year long until that time. 
Um, and he would always make sure they had uh, ice cream for dessert, which back then was a much more exotic treat than it is today. I mean, I, you know, I, I know kids who get ice cream several times a week, and back in those days, it just didn't happen. John J. Flynn opened the Flynn Theater in 1930, and gosh, what a wonderful show place it is. I, when I go in to see a Flynn show, I'm reminded of just uh, what a gracious place it is and what a, wonderful, what, a, what a wonderful place that sets the scene for any kind of entertainment I'm waiting for. Um, John J. Flynn was not just a businessman, um, not, just, not just a man who created theaters. He had a hand in bringing the electric trolley car to town. And his humble beginnings probably let him have a greater understanding of what it was like to be those children who sold newspapers on the street or people who just struggled day to day. He didn't start off with money. He was a farm boy who came to the outskirts of Burlington and worked for a farmer and then managed that farm and then bought that farm. So quite a story. Um, he also was interested, not just in philanthropy um, that way, but he was one of these people who managed to make deals to keep the city of Burlington viable. Um, back in the 1930s, there was a broom company here in the city of Burlington, and they decided they were going to move to St. Albans because they knew they could save money because in St. Albans, the taxes were lower. And John J. Flynn got some other businessmen together, and he said, no, we can't. We really can't let this happen. And so they got everybody in a room and talked to them, and they managed to keep this broom factory in the city of Burlington. I think it's a, an amazing thing. And there, uh, before the Flynn opened, all of these wonderful banners strung across the streets. I don't know whether you've heard, but the Flynn Theater is one of the most haunted places in the city of Burlington. Um, we believe that the gentleman who is called the Flynn Ghost may be a worker who was kind of taken on on the down low. Surely there were people who, there were crews who were assigned to build that place, but there's a rumor um, from some folks I know who are in Lyric Theater Company that John J. Flynn started to get a little nervous because he's got all these signs, you know, post. It's like, it's going to open. Here's when it's opening. Um, and that he said to his fellows, are we ready? And they said, well, we might not be. And so they hired a few people off the books. And we think that maybe one of those fellows was working none too carefully and fell to his death inside the Flynn Theater. So many people have seen him. There are about five ghosts that I've heard mentioned in the Flynn, but this character, the worker in gray worker's overalls and dusty boots, has been seen so many times that we simply call him the Flynn Ghost. <laughs> All right, this is a personal story before I get on to the last two sort of uh, better known stories that shaped us in more modern times here in the city. Dorothy Robar O'Leary Shea Martin. Why so many names? Well, this is my grandmother with the green circle. Back in the day, uh, next to her is uh, my Aunt Doris, great Aunt Doris. And then uh, the, little, the little kid is their youngest sister, Leona. There's a picture of my grandmother there, all dressed up, maybe for a date. I don't know. But so many names because, as her younger brother said, she liked to get married. <laughs> <laughs> she Married and married and married and married and married. But there was a period of time, this is the story that uh, is in a couple of my books, Wicked Vermont and in True Crime Stories of Burlington, Vermont. And the reason I ended up putting them in the book was, you know, when you're a writer and you're assigned a book by your publisher, there's an awful lot of going into old newspapers and falling down the rabbit hole of history. Just, I, I can't even tell you how many times I'd be looking for some mass murderer or some terrible crime that happened in Plattsburgh, and I see some little article and I say, oh my goodness, what's that? Click, and then all of a sudden I'm down, down, down. Ah, I was reading about the blue laws in the city of Burlington. <laughs> You'll know what the blue laws are. The blue laws, for any of you who don't know, there was a time back in the city of Burlington where on a Sunday, you could not buy anything that wasn't food. Nothing. Detergent, soap, toilet paper, nothing. Well, my grandmother lived on Battery Street with her children. She was a newly divorced mother of five. 
four at the time. I'm sorry, gosh, there was one kid added later. That was um, Shay. So <laughs> anyway, um, so here she is, newly divorced. Um, she was a person on Battery Street back in the day who was one of those wild women who did all these things that they weren't supposed to do. Um, she was a banker for many people on Battery Street. She would take money <laughs> that women didn't want their husbands to know they had or that husbands didn't want their wives to know they had, and she would put it under a floorboard in her kitchen and keep it safe. It was better than the bank. She knew exactly where it was. Just little notes on little on little paper wrapped up, who, who had what. Um, she, she wasn't in a position, oh, holy cow. She wasn't in a position to, it did it again. Wait a minute. Um, it's gone away. I'm not sure what I did. You didn't do anything. <laughs> I'm just going to talk until we figure it out. Um, she wasn't in a position to loan money, but, um, but she was a banker. She also was sort of the neighborhood doctor. I mean, if somebody's kid had a, an injury that was too major uh, to be minor, but too minor to call a physician, then she was usually the person who knew how to patch them up. But uh, as this young, newly divorced woman, she needed to make a few extra bucks. And so she was selling whiskey out of her back door on Battery Street on Sundays. People would come and they'd tell her that they wanted to buy a shot. And she'd say, OK, come around to the back door. And, um, and she'd usually try to do this when her kids were off you know, at a neighbor's house or something, or her aunt's house, you know, getting, uh, being minded over there. So on this one particular day, I learned from the newspaper, on this one particular day, Dorothy O'Leary at the time um, opened her door. And there was a young gentleman standing there wearing a very nice suit and top coat. And a, and a wonderful fedora hat. And he asked to buy a shot. And she looked at him and then said, yes, you know what's coming. <laughs> she looked at this gentleman and she said, sure, come around to the back door. So he's headed to the back door. And the younger, um, the younger woman in the picture, the teenager that you saw, my aunt, my aunt Doris, who everyone called Dodo, she says, Dot, you're not going to sell to this guy, are you? And my grandmother said, of course I am. Did you get a look at him? He's gorgeous. <laughs> so she opens the door, invites him in, takes the whiskey out from under the sink, puts it on the table, pours the shot. He gives her the money. And then a bunch of liquor control agents come swarming into her apartment. <laughs> terrible, terrible thing. So I see this. And a lot of this is, um, a lot of this wasn't in the articles online. It was told to me by my mother, who I called and said, Mom, Grandma was arrested for selling liquor out of her back door. And she said, I thought you knew that. <laughs> I said, how would I know that? It was the 40s. <laughs> I wasn't born yet. And she said, well, you know, she told me the whole story. And, um, and, and uh, you know, apparently because she had a sweet smile and an angelic face, when she got in front of the judge, uh, they dropped the charges except for this little fine that she had to pay. I think a $12, probably a lot of money to her back in the day, $12 fine. But um, I think, how many other relatives in my, how many other people have done these things I know nothing about? It's crazy. Oh, I will tell you, uh, I said, how many other people? And she said, well, there was that one cousin who was arrested. And uh, he, he actually died in jail because he threw somebody down a well. But there was that. Um, you just never know. Um, and then there was Donald DeMag. Donald DeMag in the late 1940s and early 1950s was the topic of so many news stories in the Burlington Free Press and the Burlington Daily News. This was a young man who lived on North Street in the city of Burlington. Uh, he had a, um, he, uh, he unfortunately um, was partially deaf, pretty, prof pretty, pretty profoundly uh, deaf for, um, uh, you know, for day-to-day -day conversation with people. And his parents, during that time, uh, deafness was a stigma. He was sent away to school, but the school was pretty hell-bent on just, um, you know, teaching, just teaching people how to read lips. They didn't teach American Sign Language at the time. So Donald DeMag um, was, was pretty much sunk. He began to be a behavioral problem. And then in his late teens and early 20s, he started taking things. Um, Finally, as a man in his 20s with a wife and a young child, he strikes up an acquaintance with a man on Center Street in Burlington who owned a, um, a harness shop. That man's name was Francis Rassico. So Francis Rassico is a man in his 80s, and Donald DeMag goes in and says, listen, I lost my job, and I need to borrow $200. 
Rasiko says, no, I can't loan you the money. So Demag waits until Rasiko turns around and then picks up the big iron coal shaker from next to the wood stove and bludgeons him, uh, hitting him 18 times, killing the man, and he flees. He's eventually caught and he's eventually tried and he's put in prison down in Windsor. And after a period of time, deciding that prison is not for him, he escapes. Now, something I should tell you about Donald DeMag is it might, be, might have been easier back in those days for him to, dis him to escape than it would have been some other folks because he was um, considered a danger, kind of powerfully built. He didn't spend his time in prison just sitting around eating bonbons. He was, he was working out. And so there were guards who were, who were just plain scared of him. Um, maybe the, the whole idea of the communication barrier and all that might have had something to do with it too. So anyway, he escapes. And when he's caught, it's up by the Canadian border. He is actually picked up while hitchhiking by a border patrol agent. So the guy, uh, the guy says, what are you, you know, hey, where are you going? And Mag is kind of, you know, iffy about his answers. And finally, the guy says, if you don't tell me what's going on with you, I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to take you to jail. And he says, well, I actually escaped from prison in Windsor, and I'm kind of happy that you picked me up because it's so stressful to be out here <laughs> trying to hide from everybody. So they send him back, and this time he goes to prison and he makes a friend, Francis Blair, who's another sort of malcontent, uh, habitual offender. And the two of them break out of prison. They uh, steal a laundry truck, break through the prison gates, and they're finally found in the area of Springfield, Vermont, after they assault a man named Donald Wethrop and kill his wife, Elizabeth. So uh, it's just a terrible story. Uh, Donald DeMag, kind of a guy who it seems never really had many advantages in life, certainly, um, but ended up just becoming an habitual offender and a, and a serial escape artist. Um, he was. Um, he's here because he was the last man to be executed by Vermont's electric chair. Um, you know, uh, in the 70s, there, there was a long period of time from the early 50s to the 1970s when the state of Vermont said, yeah, we're not going to execute people anymore because it's cruel and unusual punishment. But Donald DeMag was the last. And that electric chair is at the Vermont Historical Society, but it is not on display. It's in the basement with a sheet over it. Um, this people feel that it is just too touchy a topic for, uh, it's just too touchy a display um, to, to put out there for people to take a look at. And this is, yeah, this is somebody that um, is going to be recognizable to a lot of people even though they're only mug shots. I decided to use the mug shots because um, so this is Louis Hamlin and Jamie Savage, who in the spring of 1981 abducted, uh, they actually detained and um, abducted, uh, abducted two Essex Junction girls, 12 year old girls, who were on their way home from Albert D. Lawton School. They had cut through the Maple Street Park and they were in that wooded area there when these two boys who were up to no good um, decided that they were going to torment these girls and terrorize them. They actually shot them, uh, shot them with an air pistol, stabbed them, and did kill one of them. One of them actually died. Melissa Walbridge died from her injuries. Now, the state of Vermont was shocked and outraged by these crimes, but they were also completely outraged by the fact that Jamie Savage, as a 15-year-old, was not going to get uh, any kind of comeuppance for for what he had done. Uh, Louis Hamlin at 16 would be tried as an adult, and he was. But um, Jamie Savage would serve three years uh, in detention, and then at the age of 18, he'd be free. And so people just couldn't stomach the concept of that. And so it changed our laws. Uh, it just, uh, the legislature convened a special session that spring, and they changed the laws so that um, Vermont went from, uh, from looking at someone like Jamie Savage, a 15-year-old, as a child, to having some of the toughest juvenile, um, juvenile laws in the, you know, in the juvenile crime laws in the country. Um, so I'd mentioned that Louis Hamlin was 16, and um, you know, he served 45 years uh, to life for aggravated sexual assault and murder um, for the murder of Melissa Walbridge. It's just um, interesting and, 
and shocking to me, um, you heard the introduction about me. I grew up in the Old North End and was living in the Old North End uh, with my, my mother and my siblings when this crime occurred. And uh, as I've written in the book, True Crime Stories, my brother uh, attended school with Louis Hamlin and he came home one day uh, after school and he's raiding the refrigerator and he said, hey, Louis Hamlin, I said, what's new? And he said, Louis Hamlin shaved his beard. And uh, right away I thought, well, that's strange, and he must look so completely different. And that was one of the things that made it difficult for the authorities to figure out who this kid was who'd committed the crime, because after shaving his beard, uh, he, they had to rely on other people's testimony about, oh, yeah, they looked at the mug shots, and there were several different sets of mug shots. And by the time they got to this one, even Louis Hamlin's aunt reported to somebody, yeah, I think that's my nephew. So they were eventually caught. So I think that is probably what I've, yeah, there we go. And there are all the books, there are my books with the History Press, True Crime Stories of Burlington, Vermont, um, Lakeview Cemetery, Haunted Burlington, Wicked Vermont, Haunted Inns and Ghostly Getaways, and Ghosts and Legends of Lake Champlain, which was crazy to write because my publisher got in touch um, the first week in March and said, we're kind of light in our Haunted series this year, can you write a book? And I said, sure. I'm like, when do you need it? She said, June 1st. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, uh, so that was my husband, who is a wonderful, my husband Roger is so great. He just said, the dog, the kids, the house, I've got it. Write the book. Write the book. <laughs> and then the other book is There's a Witch in My Sock Drawer. That is a, a book for kids. Um, a friend of mine, um, Bianca Shera, who used to be Bian Bianca Slota, um, who was a reporter at WCAX TV. That's where we met. Uh, she, has a, she has a child who is three, and she sent me a note via Facebook the other day saying, I just want to let you know that this is currently Julian's favorite book, and that always makes me really happy. Um, there's a um, retired police officer, detective uh, from the city of Burlington, Emmett Hellrich, who some of you may know that name, and uh, he has a son, Jack, who's a teenager now, and uh, I'd given Jack the book, and Emmett ran into me one day and he said, oh, Jack loves your book. We have to read it every night. And I said, oh, that's great. And he said, no, it's long. <laughs> <laughs> it's long. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, that's, I, I want to open it up to, uh, got a little bit of time. I want to open up for some questions, if you, if you have some. But thank you so much. This has been so much fun, so much fun. Paul that is from the 1800s. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, I forget the doctor's name. Yeah, is it Hitchcock? Wait a minute, was it Hitchcock? Hitchcock. Hitchcock. Yeah, and it's owned by the Handys right now. Yes, I think it was Hitchcock, I want to say, but. I love the house, and I wish that it was owned by the city of Burlington and became like a historical society museum or something, because I think it's getting not. Yeah. For, but do you know much about that? I don't know a ton about it. I know that I know that the doctor was one of the cohorts of Timothy Follett, and um, it's it's uh, you, know, you just walk in there and just uh, well, I have I have only been in there when it was cut up after it was cut up into apartments, but. Um, and this was probably 15 years ago, going inside and looking at some of the woodwork and looking at some of the ways that it was carved up was a little bit like, a, you know, alternately delighted and sad. Um, there are a lot of places here in the city of Burlington that I wish the city of Burlington had gotten a hold of before, bef before they ended up, you know, in the hands of people who would turn them into apartments. Lord knows we need housing, but um, there's, uh, I didn't go into Gideon King, um, probably the most famous smuggler in the state of Vermont. Uh, Gideon King's house is a house um, on King Street in Burlington. King Street was named after him. And it's this red brick house that has a massage place in it, maybe a law office, I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, uh, going in there, I went in, uh, I think, a few years ago to buy a massage gift certificate for someone. And um, you walk in, and it's still apparent that the building's old, but to see these places that were absolutely, that were owned by people who were so incredibly interesting. I mean, Gideon King was a guy who, um, I'm gonna digress and I apologize in advance. I'll try not to be too long. Gideon King um, was um, 
did not care that we had a trade embargo going on in the early 1800s. And um, one night he was on his ship out on Lake Champlain and there was a, a customs agent who stopped his boat and the, the customs agent got on the boat with two of his men and he said, Gid King, we know what you're up to with the smuggling business and if you don't stop, it will go bad for you. And apparently King drew himself up to his full height and looked the agent in the eye and said, ask me, do I care? <laughs> I allow no man to tell me how to run my business. Why should the President of the United States be any different? So a guy like that, who a street is named after him and there's his house, you kind of wish it was a, a museum of some sort. I, I certainly do. So, so the Black Snake affair that, that happened down here on the, on the river. Yeah. That was part of that. Whole, yeah, uh, the Black Snake affair was, yeah, we were talking about the Black Snake. marker right down there. Yeah, the Black Snake Affair um, is another one of those situations where, uh, and, and this was, a f this was um, much more overblown than the Gideon King thing, this, this yeah. fracas in which a farmer is killed and, yeah. and these Irishmen yeah. uh, are, you know, certainly they've got the blame pinned on them and, and one guy is finally hanged and, and it's a spectacle for the entire city of Burlington and beyond. People just came from out of town to see this man hanged. That was entertainment back in those days. Anybody else? Yes. The, uh, are you writing another book at this time? I'm, I am writing a book right now, but not for my publisher. I'm writing a book called Saint of Circumstance, which is a novel about a young man. It's kind of a coming of age novel uh, about a young woman first, and then her young son, whose lives start off um, in Louisiana, and she comes uh, to live with relatives in Vermont, bounces to California, and then, and then back again. And the, about 50% of the books is uh, set in Burlington. But definitely a work of fiction about how people are not always what they seem, and people's shortcomings don't always make them. So um, right now, that is in the, I'm hoping, my last edit stage. Um, I've had some beta readers who have read it, and I'm going to be looking for an agent, because the history press doesn't do, non -fic doesn't do fiction, only nonfiction. Who's somebody back there? Yeah. Have you done, delved into uh, Queen City Park and the attempt to communicate with the dead? I have, and I'm, I'm trying to think of whether or not that was uh, in my, might have been in Haunted Burlington. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but Queen, the Queen City Park area was a real hotbed of, um, of a sort of psychic uh, activity back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And there's been talk of people having these seances and things and these wonderful hotels that were visited by people from not just the United States, but, um, but Europe back in the day. And I've read stories of these ritualistic dances trying to call forth spirits. People on the beach there at Queen City Park, ladies naked in the misty moonlight, oh, holding hands. <laughs> yes, so it's definitely something that I would love to look into. I've, I, it's one of those, for me, it's like so many books, so little time. There's a, a book that I was sent uh, by my publisher, and I think it's, it's called Witches, Wenches, and Wild Women is the series <laughs> they're doing now. And I got to thinking about my grandmother and also a woman named Philomene Lemoyne, who was probably the most notorious madam the city of Burlington had ever seen. And then I thought about other women who would be considered wild, who really, we wouldn't think of them as wild these days, but, um, oh, and there's a, a, a young woman I write about in my, in my latest book, um, in True Crime Stories, who, um, who, who was uh, basically caught by the police helping her boyfriend, who was a barber, smuggle hoot, uh, pour hooch down the drain when the police broke in. She would be a wild woman. So I thought, could I write a book about witches, wenches, and wild women? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I might, I don't know. If anybody yeah. else would like to ask uh, Thea some questions or talk to her, just stick around afterwards, okay? Okay. Uh, what announcement on Feb our next talk is February 18th. And the speaker is uh, Jack Kelly, who's a nationally known author. He doesn't live in Vermont, so his talk is going to be on Zoom. But it will be recorded by Town Meeting Television, and it will be available for viewing at other times also. Okay? So, Thea, again, thank you for Thank coming. you all so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.